So I want to explore two things in my talk today. The first is a reflection on what it means to me to lead and operate during times of high volatility, uncertainty, complexity or ambiguity, or VUCA to use a management acronym. I'm then going to consider the role of John Elliman Foundation, the organisation that I lead in supporting the museums and gallery sector as part of the wider funding ecosystem. So I hope that people are looking forward to he hearing my thoughts on leadership and then grant making. That's the name of the game this morning. So I think it's fair to say that many of us here today would be hard pressed to find a better example than COVID-19 as a demonstration of, a, of an event that has resulted in high volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity, not just in our professional lives, but personally too. It's no wonder that last year words like unprecedented were used in almost every conversation that we had. We've been dealing with a situation unlike anything we've ever experienced before, but for many working across civil society and the museums and gallery sector specifically, the pandemic came on the back of a period of many, many years of unpredictability and uncertainty be that due to funding pressures, changing visitor demographics and needs, reductions in staffing levels, and so on. In some ways, by the time the first lockdown began, many in this audience were already used to a paucity of time for reflection and were already making decisions that weighed up multiple and often competing factors at once. So, based on my own experience, what do I think are the implications for leadership when dealing with such high levels of VUCA or volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity over such a long period of time. So the last while teaches us that crises require leaders to foster adaptation, embrace disequilibrium, would help if I could say it, and generate leadership, not just in ourselves, but in those around us, our peers, our teams. So as leaders, we need to embrace the need to operate within the paradoxes of leadership. For example, we need to act consistently, don't we, as leaders, but we also must show adaptability. This means becoming less linear in our thinking and feeling much more com comfortable holding diametrically opposed ideas sim simultaneously, and then perhaps generating a new idea based on those ideas that was superior to anything that we'd come up with before that. Often as leaders, we need to become much more comfortable in embracing options and solutions that involve multiple working hypotheses in order to deliver on a vision from multiple standpoints. We're often thinking of ourselves in the shoes of not just our team, it's our visitors, it's our uh, fellow funders in our case, and so on and so forth. We're often thinking from the standpoint of multiple different uh, stakeholders. So I think that these are times which mean that we might not even be committing to a grand and detailed strategic plan. There is perhaps more value now in running numerous experiments and giving ourselves a framework through which we can be innovative and creative and most importantly, test ideas. This, I think, allows us to tackle the immediate and current challenges and build adaptability, which I think is really important at the moment. It is in operating with uncertainty and ambiguity that we can benefit from acknowledging as leaders that we don't have all of the answers and that we have to reflect critically on our own practices in order to bring about the change that is much needed and long overdue. My hope is that we'll be getting better at letting go and supporting those with the skills and expertise to get on and do the work. I hope that as we continue in our work to tackle things like the climate and biodiversity crises, anti-globalism, racism, and a whole host of systemic and structural barriers causing inequality, we invest in leadership that prioritizes the following four capabilities. And I think that museums and galleries have a very vital role to play in addressing all of those issues that I've just mentioned. So these four capabilities, the first is sense-making. So this is about understanding the context in which we operate and it isn't just about mapping out a situation, it's mapping it out in a way that is creative and doing so from a place of real humility and a place of real commitment to learning. It's always going to be a continuous process. The map that we are making emerges from a melding of observations, data, experiences, conversations and analyses. 
sense making requires continuous improvement and testing principles in a way that is open to applying different frameworks and not just the existing ones. Sense making is about thinking differently. The second quality or capability that I hope that we can show as leaders is around relating. This for me means how do we build relationships within and across organizations and how do we build trusting relationships that recognize that we are not independent of each other, we are interdependent of each other. So we do this by inquiring um, and being um, committing to connection. We do this by trying to understand other perspectives with an open mind and without judgment. We do this by encouraging others to share their opinions, to think about how people might respond to what we're saying and how we can support them to share what they're thinking. Um, this is a quality that requires us to think about what our own prejudices are, but also to try and speak in a way that isn't always about bottom lines or the simplest common denominators, but to get comfortable in the fact that we may have opposing or differing views. Um, so it's not about just being in agreement all the time. It's about recognizing that we can disagree and we can engage in conflict, but we can do so in a way that's ultimately productive. So the third um, leadership capability is around visioning. And that's really something that museums and galleries do day in, day out. It's about creating a compelling picture of the future. And what's beautiful about this sector is how you use the past and present to inform what that future will look like. And then the fourth and final capability I would mention is about inventing. This is about developing new ways to achieve the vision and to give it life and meaning. Again, something that we know this sector is incredible at. And just to kind of wrap up what I was thinking around leadership, I've been reading a lot about the concept of quiet leadership and how you exercise judgment effectively as leaders. And this has really weighed on my mind in the last year and well, 20 months really for very obvious reasons. So there are many definitions of what a quiet leader is. It's often the person delivering change and progress who may be overlooked for a myriad of reason, reasons. They might not have a fancy job title. Uh, they may belong to a smaller or less well-funded organization within their subsector or their visible and invisible labels may mean that others consider them less than. Many quiet leaders have the skills, capabilities and resources that I've described to you just now. I passionately believe that the change only thrives and succeeds because of the quiet leaders within, within the change. These are the people who are doing the hard and necessary background work through which the building blocks that no longer serve us are dismantled and replaced with a new world order that prioritises environmental, economic and societal justice. I hope in time we'll do more to celebrate these quiet leaders. So there's a few thoughts from me on leadership. And I thought it was important to share those first as I think they also give you an insight into some of the things that we've been thinking about at John Elliman Foundation since I joined back in January, 2020. So I'm now going to move on and talk about John Elliman Foundation where I work and how we've been supporting museums and galleries um, during this last little while. So we're privileged to be part of an ecosystem of independent grant makers operating in the museums and gallery sector, from the large like Esme Fairburn Foundation to the medium and smaller like Museums Galleries Scotland, Art Fund and Headley. Element has been supporting museums and galleries for several years through our annual Museums and Galleries Fund which distributes about £550,000 each year. So we are a smaller funder in this space for sure. When the pandemic struck, like many within the funding sector, we signed up to the We Stand With The Sector pledge, which was coordinated by London funders and signed by hundreds of funders in the UK. Through this pledge, I was utterly inspired by the many ways in which funders across the funding ecology reimagined the art of the po possible. Funders were called on to prioritise and offer flexibility, adaptability and support to the applicant, applicants and those that they fund. We did so in many ways, including launching emergency funds, providing grant uplifts, changing reporting requirements and removing breaks between a grant ending and an organisation reapplying. 
it was really heartening to be part of a sector that was so responsive but I completely recognize that there's always more that we could have done and could be doing and so I'm not going to sit here and say that we did a perfect job as a funding ecology. Um, I also know that some funders had to close to new applications or close completely but many stayed open and delivered more support than they would have ordinarily and I'm sure Sarah will talk about this in a huge amount of detail in terms of art funds exemplar response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So at Elliman, we remained open throughout the crisis. And since the first lockdown, we've made 12 grants worth around 1 million through two rounds of our museums and galleries fund. So we made seven in May, 2020 and five in May, 2021. So these grants went towards core costs of curatorial work. That is the area that we try and support each year. And we were really heartened by the fact that each institution that we supported has demonstrated real commitment to nurturing and championing curatorial excellence and expertise within their organization for the benefit of their visitors, their communities, the industries and causes they represent and the wider museum profession. Throughout our assessment of applications, we saw time and again, just how resourceful and creative the sector has been in the face of the pandemic. We read countless descriptions of museums expanding their reach by transforming their digital and online offer. Many continued important curatorial work exploring the origins of their collections. Others invested time and talent in producing an engaging visitor experience that was COVID-19 compliant and made great use of their indoor and or outdoor spaces. We used the pandemic as an opportunity to think more deeply about how we could deliver more with our very limited funds. So to this end, we've been active participants in something that's called the Arts Funders Group. This was set up in response to the pandemic and it's a group of independent grant makers in the arts and it's convened by the Paul Hamlin Foundation and you can find out more about it on the Funders Collaborative Hub. And it was from within this group and our wider networks that Elliman convened fellow funders in the museums and gallery space and committed to working together to share our learning and experiences of designing and delivering funding programs during COVID. We were particularly nervous around how we would deal with the higher than usual demands for the funds that we had available and how we would say no to organizations at a time like this when there is so much stress and a reduction of resilience that we wanted to think carefully about how we said no in a way that was affirming, if you can ever say no in an affirming way. So in our last round of the Museums and Galleries Fund, this led to a sharing details of the organisations we weren't able to fund with other funders. And in a couple of instances, this has led to those funders taking on um, applications that we had to reject um, and they've taken them on through their own processes. So through our commitment to think about what more we could be doing as a funder in the museums and gallery sector, the other thing we've been doing is that we've been working closely with Art Fund, Esme Fairbairn Foundation, Paul Hamlin Foundation and the Museums Association on support for decolonizing and repatriation work because we know that this is something that the sector is dealing with in a very robust and effective way and we want to be supportive of that. Um, so speaking more broadly, I think that there has been a genuine commitment and ambition within the grant sector to learn from and embed new ways of working from the last 20 months and to avoid reverting completely to our pre-pandemic ways. So I hope that this will mean that we'll continue op to operate with greater trust and transparency and a renewed focus on redressing the power imbalances that exist between funders and those they fund. This is going to require long-term sustained efforts. It's more than using a hashtag or writing a blog or signing up to a pledge. It's about us as funders ceding our own power and privilege and recognizing the power and expertise of people and communities and organizations who live and breathe the causes that they care about. And it's about embracing the notion that the pursuit of excellence in grant making isn't a nice to have or a tick box exercise, it's essential if we want sectors we care about, like the museums and gallery sector, to thrive. So if you see us straying or falling back into old patterns, hold us to account. 
um, and know that there are also many others within the sector like our membership bodies that are also holding us to account and it's important that we do push to do better. So I wanted to end by saying that John Elliman Foundation's current round of the Museums and Galleries Fund is now open for applications and the deadline to apply is 7th of January 2022 and all the details about the fund and how to apply are on our website. And having been at parts of this year's um, Museums Association Conference and hearing the discussions that have been happening over the course of this conference so far, um, I am completely certain that there's going to be plenty for us to support within the museums and gallery sector through this next round of our Museums and Galleries Fund. And I hope that if you take a look at the grants we have made in this space, as well as the things we've said in this space, um, that you will see that we as a funder are very much um, open to and listening to the discussions that the sector is having on things like decolonization, the climate and biodiversity crises, audience and visitor engagement in person, digitally and in communities, and so much more. Our lens has always been around curatorial expertise and excellence because as a funder, our commitment um, is to try and add value and to complement the funding ecology that we are a part of. We know that we contribute a very small amount at 550,000 or thereabouts each year. And so we try to do so in a way that is helpful ultimately and um, to operate in a way that um, adds to what's already being delivered by larger and more expert funders who operate within the museums and gallery sector. So those are my reflections on leadership um, and um, I, I hope that they provide you with a bit of a framing about some of the thinking that we're doing as a grant maker and how that then feeds into the work that we deliver. And I'll just say very quickly those four capabilities that I think that um, we as grant makers, sorry, as leaders should be um, really prioritizing and that is sense making, relating, visioning and inventing. And I can think of uh, no better sector that epitomizes those four capabilities already. Um, so thank you so much for listening and um, looking forward to Sarah's comments and um, reflections and the question and answer session later. Thanks so much.